All right, good morning, or maybe good afternoon or good evening, or even good night, depending on where you're watching. Thank you for attending this Applied Flow Technology webinar. I'll be your presenter today. My name is Nick Vastein. I'm a business applications engineer with Applied Flow Technology, or AFT. If you ever ask a support question or a sales question, there's a pretty high likelihood that I'll be the person that you'll be talking to. So if we've uh, had a chat before or looked at a model before, glad to see you could attend this webinar. And if not, uh, very nice to meet you. Happy to introduce myself. So hopefully you're all here. You're hopefully you're all in the right place, ready to learn about cavitation. And not cavitation in the traditional sense, where usually you'll look at it for pumps and ensuring they have enough head to avoid cavitation, but some of the unique circumstances that can cause cavitation, specifically during transient analysis. So if you're an AFT impulse user, you may be familiar with cavitation already, in which case we'll look at some of the basics and how you can address them in your model. Or if you're just starting into transient analysis, this may be a good introductory point of why you need to consider cavitation. So the big question we have to ask ourselves with cavitation and with transient analysis is how low can you go? In this case, how low can our pressure go in our system? Usually we're much more concerned about high pressures in our system, but low pressures can be equally devastating. One of the reasons it can be devastating is this cause of cavitation, which we'll get into a lot more thoroughly as we go into the webinar. So that's our short introduction. We have a lot to cover today. It's a pretty complex topic and it relies pretty heavily on an understanding of transient analysis and kind of transient hydraulics, whether that be how pressure waves transmit through a system and how valve closures can affect things. So if you aren't completely comfortable with that, that's okay, we'll do the best that we can with what we have to really squeeze out as much knowledge as we can out of this hour. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump in. Before getting into the transient cavitation portion of the transient cavitation webinar, let's first take a look at some additional resources. So water hammer analysis or transient analysis is a complex topic, not always covered in education and with your general engineering degree. So webinars like ours certainly can help uh, flesh out your knowledge a bit more. One of the additional resources that AFT has committed to a bit more recently is waterhammer.com. So waterhammer.com is a collection of articles really covering all sorts of hydraulic transient concepts. So we've written a, couple, a collection of article series and we've written them across a few different topics. So we start from fundamentals with water hammer concepts, taking a look at things like wave speed and communication time or the Joukowsky equation, how water hammer can influence your system through different components, how you can design your system to be conservative, specifically for hydraulic events, taking a look at valve closures, which plays nicely into how you can mitigate a surge or water hammer event. So if you find a lot of value in what you learned today and if you're getting deeper into the weeds of transient analysis and especially AFT impulse, taking a look at waterhammer.com and taking a look at these concepts can certainly help. So something to keep in the back of your mind if you're you know, late at night and you're looking for something to read, this may be a good resource to help you better understand how these transients can impact your specific system. Waterhammer.com is more of a self-starter resource if instead you want to talk directly with a person, we also offer flow expert packages from AFT. In this case, you can work directly with an AFT engineer. It might be me, it might be someone else on our support or engineering team. And we can take a look directly at your model. So we can look at what assumptions you're making building your model, how to more accurately model a component in your system. We can double check your input. Or if you're just interested in learning concepts, we can also develop some course material for you and your team. So again, really mainlining the information, working directly with an AFT engineer. We're in the trenches, in the weeds all the time dealing with hydraulics, so it's always great to speak with an expert when you're uncertain. If you have a problem that you feel is outside of your wheelhouse, a flow expert package may not be enough. In that case, you may wanna look at a consultant. So Purple Mountain Technology Group is a sister company of AFT. They work in the same office. They have all sorts of feedback as we're developing the software and they're some of the best power users that we have. 
So if you want to be completely hands-off, you know transients are an issue or you have other issues in your system, feel free to reach out to Purple Mountain Technology Group and they'd be happy to help you out. So part of their description, comprehensive transient analysis, all sorts of systems, all sorts of industries. They've seen LNG, offloading, wastewater systems, pump trips, surge accumulator sizing, really just running the gamut of options for hydraulic analysis. So these are additional resources. If what we go over today sparks an interest and you want to find some more information about transient analysis and water hammer, these are where I would recommend to start besides just experimenting an impulse, experimenting with your system and really learning by doing. So with those additional resources out of the way, now we can jump into the agenda and really focus on what we're here for today. So with transient cavitation, we're gonna start really bare bones and really start with a foundation with what is cavitation? What can cause cavitation? Again, it's more common to consider in pumps, but with transient analysis and the significant changes in pressure, cavitation is also an important consideration during your transient analysis. That said, why should we be worried about cavitation? So what are the consequences that cavitation can have on your system and why should we design to try to mitigate it or avoid it entirely? To mitigate it, first you have to understand what can cause cavitation. So we'll look at some pretty common cases in piping systems. We'll look at a valve closure and potentially a pump trip. We'll take a look at what that looks like in the software. And by looking at it in the software, we can see how we recognize cavitation is occurring. So there's a few different avenues. If you're more of a numbers person, we can look at output. If you're more of a systems and a concepts approach, which is how I generally like to approach analysis, we'll take a look at some graphs that you can make to really isolate the cause of cavitation in your specific system. Uh, now, AFT Impulse is a single phase modeling software and cavitation is inherently a two phase um, phenomenon. So one of the considerations that's very important to make is determining whether or not we can trust the cavitation results that AFT Impulse is going to be giving us. So we have some great guidelines. They're actually attached in the webinar. If you want to open them up and take a look, I definitely recommend downloading them for reference in the future. And they're also on our website. We have a short section dedicated to that, which really breaks it down to a more path dependent way of analyzing cavitation results. So instead of, oh, well, my pressure spike is double what I would expect it to be, it can look at how much cavitation is there, how does it react to sensitivity, and really provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to address it in your system. So let's say our cavitation results are accurate and it's a very high concern in our system, whether we're pulling a vacuum or there's a very high pressure spike, we'll take a look at some different approaches you can take to mitigate that cavitation and try to avoid anything that might cause cavitation in your system. So again, quite the gamut today, quite a few different topics, really starting from foundations all the way to how you can resolve this sort of issue within your own system. So to get us started, what is cavitation? So if you imagine a fluid going through a line, it's gonna have certain parameters like a flow rate. And depending on the fluid itself and fluid properties, it'll also have a vapor pressure. So vapor pressure, if you're not familiar or not as comfortable with it as someone with maybe a chemical engineering background, vapor pressure is the pressure a fluid sort of emits against atmosphere. And so if it is subjected to a pressure lower than that vapor pressure, it will vaporize into vapor. So if you have a pressure higher than that, higher than the vapor pressure, fluid is kept as a liquid, which is great for flowing through our pipes. But once it goes below a vapor pressure and fluid is flashing into vapor, now you have a two-phase mixture, which is a bit more concerning, and we'll find out why in a second. So again, the big point of reference that we want to compare is what is the fluid's pressure, and is that higher or lower than the vapor pressure? When it's lower than the vapor pressure, it'll flash, which is cavitation and a cause for concern. So if a vapor pocket expands to such a point that it may interrupt flow in a liquid full pipe, that can also be called column separation. So if you see this term in documentation or in other literature, just 
think of cavitation in the same way. So in some cases, we may see that those terms are interchangeable. In this webinar, we're gonna stick with cavitation as our term to describe this phenomenon of a liquid flashing into a vapor. So the formation of the vapor pocket isn't actually the concern. If you, again, have a chemical engineering background, something like a flash tank can actually use this to our advantage. So if you pressurize a line and then all of a sudden decrease the pressure, a certain amount of fluid will flash and turn into vapor. And that's a great way to separate different components of a fluid. Really the concern is when that vapor pocket forms temporarily and then repressurizes, collapses, and can cause a pressure spike. So this is the same consequence as pump cavitation. The cause of a fluid's pressure going below its vapor pressure is a little different compared to transient cavitation, but the concept is ultimately the same. If you imagine a pump with an impeller, you feed the fluid at a certain pressure, it may decrease in pressure as you accelerate it through the pump. During those low pressure events, you may form vapor pockets, and when those vapor pockets collapse, that's what's going to ultimately cause damage to your pump impeller. Along those same lines, what we're going to see in our transient analysis is instead of accelerating the fluid through a uh, impeller, we'll see how pressure waves transmitting through the system may interact and decrease below that vapor pressure to cause this vapor pocket. So along those same lines, once we form a vapor pocket, the creation of the vapor pocket isn't where a lot of the concerns are be. There are some different concerns to consider that we'll look at, but it's once this vapor pocket collapses and causes a pressure spike, that can also be a very significant concern. So drawing the line of what cavitation is, cavitation in a pump usually describes this collapse as well. Cavitation will also look at the vapor formation. So there's some blurry lines on where the term starts and stops. But in general, I just like to picture it as vapor forming when it shouldn't. And if that vapor collapses, now we may have a problem. So hopefully now we're all on the same page of what is cavitation. And we've alluded a little into why we should be worried about cavitation. So the first big point is that the collapse of those vapor pockets can result in very significant pressure spikes. So here we have an example graph that I generated an impulse. It's a very simple valve closure event where we have the pressure response directly upstream of the valve and directly downstream of the valve in blue. When we close the valve, we see the high pressure spike that we would expect. Again, that's the Joukowsky equation and typically how you would approach a water hammer issue. Uh, we also see, funnily enough, a little increase in pressure. Uh, my guess would be this is line pack. So because the fluid is now stopped, it can recover some frictional losses. And if you're familiar with the water hammer sequence, you see the high pressure wave initiate from the valve closure, and then you see the negative wave return from the valve closure, which in this case will actually cause cavitation. So here we're at, you know, essentially zero bar or zero PSI. It's convenient when it's zero because the units don't matter. And here is where we would start to see a vapor pocket form. When that vapor pocket ultimately collapses, there you can start to see pressure spikes due to that vapor pocket collapse, even in some cases exceeding what we would have predicted with this Joukowsky pressure rise. So here we could say it's about 47. If our peak pressure was instead 60, that can significantly change how we want to address this transient event if we know it's causing an issue. Similarly, on the valve outlet, it's a little different story. So in this case, cavitation would begin essentially immediately as you halt flow and vapor starts to form as the line essentially drains out. Then when the pressure wave reflects, it can start to collapse that vapor pocket causing a pressure spike. So we'll look at some other graphs that show that concept a little bit better. The big concern point that we want to touch on here is that significant pressure spikes can be caused by cavitation even more than just a typical transient event. So even larger than the Joukowsky predicted pressure rise, which is generally used as a rule of thumb to be conservative, but even more conservative is building out a model, seeing what's going to happen in your system. So why else can cavitation be a concern? 
if we instead look at it from a forces perspective, transient forces are largely dependent on the pressure differentials of a line. So if you have a sudden pressure spike on one end, that can cause a significant differential and create a significant force. So here we have that same transient event of a valve closure. So the same pressure response that we just looked at where it was positive and negative and the positive spike in the uh, downstream valve. And here we can see what kind of forces would result from that transient event. So again, anytime you're looking at pressure and pressure waves, forces are probably gonna be a significant piece of that. And again, it's very convenient in impulse to take your existing system and then apply different force sets to it to see how the force response will change instead of just isolating the pressure. So with these spikes, you get a very aggressive wave front. And by wave front, I mean how steeply pressure changes as the pressure wave uh, moves through the system. And that steep wave front can cause very significant swings in pressure as well, or swings in forces rather. So on one end, you may be pulling one direction very significantly. Then as the pressure wave shifts, it's pulling significantly in the opposite direction. And this oscillation can be a significant cause of concern. So high pressures from pressure spikes can lead to high forces. And those uh, reflecting back and forth can be catastrophic or certainly a concern within your system. So cavitation also occurs generally at very low pressures. Uh, in the case of water, the vapor pressure is about a quarter of a bar or a quarter of an atmosphere about. So at a quarter of an atmosphere, generally that means you're going to be pulling a vacuum or you're going below atmospheric condition, which can collapse your pipe. So here we have the graph of the same transient event. Here's our valve that we were closing originally. We have our steady state operating pressure, and then here we can see this time in gauge pressure that we're going below atmospheric nearly through the entire pipe. So that can be a concern, a different kind of concern. Usually water hammer analysis is more focused on this high pressure and how do you mitigate the high pressures in the system, but low pressures can also be equally as devastating, if not more. One caveat to this is it very much depends on what fluid that you have in your system. If you have something very volatile like methane going through your line, then the vapor pressure is gonna be well above atmospheric. If you imagine leaving gasoline out, that'll evaporate much faster than leaving water out. That's due to the different fluid vapor pressures. So instead of cavitating and causing vapor at this sub-atmospheric pressure, it may be higher in which case vacuum conditions may not be as much a concern. And there you would be focusing more on avoiding vapor to avoid that resulting high pressure spike. So other things can impact your fluid's vapor pressure as well. So since it's a function of temperature, if your fluid is very hot, that may increase the vapor pressure. If your fluid's very cold, that may decrease the vapor pressure. And all of those can have an impact on when and where cavitation occurs within your system. So now we've looked at the concerns. There's three big pieces, pressure spikes and their resulting forces, as well as vacuum conditions, depending on what fluid you're pumping through your system. So now let's take a look at what can cause cavitation. So what caused those graphs that we looked at before? Generally, cavitation is a concern anytime a low pressure can be generated. So anytime our pressure is decreasing, that's a concern because it's getting closer and closer to that vapor pressure line. So anytime we look at a low pressure wave in a typical transient analysis, that may be a cause of concern for cavitation depending on your overall operating pressure. So in our case, if we look at downstream of a rapid valve closure, that can cause a low pressure wave because all of a sudden you're reducing the amount of volumetric flow rate. So here we have a Pretty simple example of a long pipeline. That'll give us plenty of time to see how the pressure wave and the volume flow rate reacts. This is really the core of the water hammer sequence. So we touch on this in some other webinars and on waterhammer.com if you wanna do some additional reading, but we'll do a pretty introductory level uh, visual here. 
So if we imagine our valve in the center of the system, we're gonna close it instantaneously or very rapidly, and we'll see what happens to the system. Something that I like to do in my transient analysis is create a prediction for the system and see if the results match that prediction. That can be a good indication that one, you understand the system, and two, how you're modeling it is adequate for the analysis that you wanna do. So in our case, when we close this valve, we expect two things. If we focus on the downstream side, we expect the flow rate, first of all, to go to zero because now we're not supplying any flow through that valve. When that flow rate goes to zero, it's gonna cause very low pressure. If you imagine the downstream pipe as a liquid column that wants to continue traveling forward, it has a certain amount of momentum that will cause a low pressure and that low pressure can cause vapor to form if it goes low enough. So if it goes low enough, that can cause cavitation. Otherwise, it'll just start to halt the fluid. So we'll see it drop to zero, and then we'll see the fluid uh, essentially snap the whip, I guess, and drop down to zero flow rate as well. So let's focus on this right side. Let's see if we can predict the future and see if that's consistent with what we would expect. So the valve rapidly closed. We see that decrease in pressure that we would expect. The decrease in pressure is what's causing this flow rate to go to zero. Again, this is our liquid column continuing to travel down the line with momentum. And this low pressure wave would be the cause of concern. So if instead of whatever, 275 PSIG, if we were instead operating at 75 PSIG, this pressure spike or this pressure decrease may cause cavitation at this point. So this is a cause for a low pressure wave. And let's see how the rest of the transient event plays out. So again, this is kind of a typical water hammer sequence where you see the oscillating high pressure and low pressure waves. On downstream of a rapid valve closure, that's the more immediate concern because it starts with a low pressure wave. So it's more likely to cavitate immediately following your transient. But if we were looking at the upstream side during that transient, we'd see something else interesting. So not only can cavitation occur downstream of a rapid valve closure, it can also happen upstream. Again, this is due to the water hammer sequence where we see the reflection of those different waves. So now let's keep an eye on this left side and let's do our prediction again. So our flow rate's gonna go to zero. Now we're slamming into a closed valve. All of this momentum has nowhere to go. So it's transmitted into high pressure. So we expect this high pressure to go up the rest of the fluid to crash into the stopped fluid and cause a high pressure wave going this way as the flow start, or starts to stop. So let's see if our prediction is correct. And it is, so we see the high pressure travel backward and we see zero flow rate. Now what we see is kind of the next component of the water hammer sequence, where now we have high pressure in our line flowing towards low pressure. So we'll see the line actually drain in reverse and we'll see this flow rate go negative. So now we have flow draining out against a closed valve, which is very similar to our downstream of a valve closure sequence. So now we expect something similar where now we're gonna go back to zero and this has to decrease in pressure to stop the flow that's going reverse through the valve or through the pipe. And that'll cause a low pressure, which is our concern for cavitation. So again, we have that low pressure. If our operating pressure was much lower, now not only are we cavitating downstream of the valve, we would also be cavitating upstream of the valve as well. One other thing to consider is pump trips. So if instead of a valve closure being your inciting event, you can have a pump providing high pressure to a system, and all of a sudden when that pump trips, now you're not providing that pressure and that can similarly cause a low pressure wave. So a lot of things can cause cavitation and understanding the potential causes can help you mitigate it much more effectively. But hopefully this is a good introduction to the water hammer sequence. Again, this is kind of foundational to transient analysis and we have great resources on waterhammer.com and also in previous webinars kind of showing this in different ways until it's very clear. But 
low pressure from downstream, a bit more clear. Reflections on the upstream side can similarly cause low pressures and pump trips when they no longer add pressure, that can cause a low pressure wave front to travel through the system. So what else can cause cavitation or what's kind of an additional concern that we should look at when exploring cavitation? So one of the main concerns should be around high points in the system. This is because pressure head and elevation head are kind of interrelated. So if you imagine a fluid has a certain amount of energy, if you go back to a Bernoulli balance, there's always kinetic energy, pressure energy, and elevation energy in the form of potential energy. So if we had a pipe like this, where we have elevation in blue, we're pumping up a hill, it flattens out and then goes back down. Here we can see a very significant drop in pressure because you're losing a lot of energy to this change in elevation. So if we imagine the frictional losses are consistent across all the pipes, when elevation is flat, this isolates just the frictional loss. So anything more steep than this piece is lost due to elevation change. So in this case, at the highest point and at the furthest length of the pipe, we actually see the lowest pressure in the system. So this is where we would be most concerned about hitting vapor pressure, because anytime we make a change to the system, if we sent a low pressure wave of 15 feet of water, sure, all of this part won't cavitate, but once it reaches this low point and this low pressure, that's where you'll see cavitation occur in your system. So that's also why you'll see vacuum breakers at high points in the system to avoid going sub-atmospheric, because at those high elevations, you're losing a lot of energy to elevation head from pressure head. If we go back to pumps for a second, it's very similar to MPSH considerations. So net positive suction head, you need to have a certain amount of pressure or equivalent liquid head for the pump to operate correctly. Again, it's ensuring that you have a certain margin above your vapor pressure so that when it accelerates and it does decrease in pressure on the impeller, it's not going to vaporize and cavitate and cause damage to that pump. So again, along those same lines, you wouldn't want to put your pump at the top of the hill where pressure head is very small and you lose a lot to elevation head. Instead, you would want to get your pump as low in the system as you can to meet those NPSH requirements. Again, sort of the same thing here. You'd want to ensure that you have sufficient pressure at these high points in the system so that if a low pressure wave goes through, there you're avoiding the most trouble area that you should be most concerned about. So concern about high points of the system, that may not be a normal concern with just steady state operation. But again, as soon as you create a transient and you're introducing pressure waves and pressure reflections, that can be a concern specifically for cavitation. All right, now we know what is cavitation, why we should be worried about it with high pressures, forces, and uh, vacuum collapse. We know what can cause it on both sides of a valve or from a pump trip. And we also know that high points in a system are particularly dangerous because of their low static pressure. So a lot of those things may be informed elsewhere in your system. So how do you recognize if cavitation is occurring within your specific model? So the first thing and the most obvious is warning messages that come up in output. What we may see often is warning messages are kind of the bane of an engineer's existence. They worry about what warning messages mean and they'll do whatever they can to get rid of a warning message without potentially addressing the cause of the warning itself. So if you see warning messages about cavitation in your system, where pipes have vapor volumes more than 10% or less than, 50, less than 100% or even more than 100%, we'll talk about how you can have more vapor in a pipe than the pipe is long in a moment. But if you see warnings like this, this should be a very good indication that cavitation is occurring in your system. So we look directly at vapor volume or describing the size of that vapor pocket. And depending on what it reports here and how many pipes and how many stations, that can indicate the scale or the extensiveness of your cavitation issue. So here was that same example that we looked at with the valve closures. So directly downstream of the valve, you see a lot more cavitation and a lot more vapor. 
whereas upstream of the valve, you see a lot less vapor. So that's just how it plays out. Again, it largely depends on your system, which is why it's great to have Impulse do all the math for you, and you can focus solely on the results and understanding why this phenomenon might be happening. That way you can try to mitigate it. So warning messages and output are great, but it doesn't necessarily tell you how that vapor pocket changes over time, or if there's much less significant vapor formation occurring. So you can also look at cavitation and determine if cavita cavitation is occurring directly through the different parameters in your model. The most important one I would say is vapor volume. So that can report both absolute vapor volume in terms of you know, cubic meters or cubic feet, but it can also tell you as a percentage of the pipe station. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about how cavitation is modeled in the system, and that'll make a much bit more sense how you can have more than 100% vapor in a station. Uh, another parameter you can look at is minimum pressure. So the minimum pressure reached in a system, it should equal the vapor pressure. You may not know what the vapor pressure is going into the system unless you specify it as a user specified fluid. But generally, if cavitation occurs in multiple sections, you'll see that same minimum pressure along all of those different stations. So these are both very analytical and can tell you kind of the worst case, kind of along the same lines as these warning messages, like this is the most cavitation that you see during the transient. But personally, I prefer looking at graphs and animations because one, it helps you understand the cause of cavitation and it also shows better how it changes over the course of the transient. So these are the three things that I would personally look at and we'll take a look at what it looks like in the software as well within Pretty simple example model. So we'll look out for warnings, we'll look at the different parameters and output, and then finally we'll make some cool graphs that really make all the pieces that we've discussed so far a bit more clear. So with that said, now we can jump into Impulse. So here we have the simple example model that I actually pulled from one of our different example models where we have a pump, a gas accumulator, that should help any transient. Usually it's for a pump trip to supply pressure, but we'll talk about that a little more in mitigation. But in our case, we added a valve at a high point in the system. So again, remember we should be worried about high points because that's where pressure is gonna be very low. And we're gonna close it very quickly so that we get a very significant pressure response. So I want a very high pressure wave on this side so that it transmits through and reflects. And I want a very, negative pressure response downstream so that we can intentionally cause cavitation. So here we have our rapid valve closure. Here we're doing a very simple closure, just over 0.1 of a second, and we ran it over 30 seconds. So something that I like to do to make some of the animations that we're gonna show off is update this pipe station output. In our case, we wanna look at this single line, and I want to see how each of these stations is segmented, mostly so I can do animations going forward. So usually by default, they would be set to inlet and outlet. Instead, you just select all of them and change them to all stations. That can increase runtime in some cases, but generally I think that the additional analysis that you can squeeze out of Impulse by making animations is a lot, uh, or it justifies the longer runtime. We also have a different webinar coming up later this year about improving your impulse runtime. So if that's an issue that you're experiencing and you wanna see how you can improve your system without killing your accuracy, definitely look out for that webinar. It's called Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger. Uh, if you're a Daft Punk fan like me, you may be a little sad <laughs> with the recent news, but that should help you section your model more effectively to improve those runtimes. So here, if we run the model, again, with all those sections and pretty long runtime, we get a decent runtime. And again, with such a simple model, it's not too bad. And now let's take a look at our output. So from output, we can see our warnings. We can see our first warning between 10% and 100% of computing volume, and our second warning more than 100%. So Again, warnings can be scary, but once you read them and understand what they're trying to tell you, 
that'll help you address it in your system. The next thing that I would look at is transient max and mins. Again, following reading these warnings, we know vapor volume is a concern. So here we can see the absolute vapor volume. This may be useful. Personally, I don't think it's as useful because generally we want to compare relative to the stations. So if instead we look at the max percentage vapor volume, now we're taking this volume divided by a computing station. So 1% cavitation may not be significant. You can see we don't really get a warning for pipe one and even less so 0 0.08 of a percent doesn't get a warning. But only once you see more significant cavitation should you be concerned that it will have pretty drastic impacts on your results. Something else we can look at is we know cavitation occurs in all of the different pipes in our system. We can also tell that based on this pressure. So with this minimum pressure, we see they're all fixed at this vapor volume. And that can be a good indication if you know the vapor volume, but generally there are some other methods that you can look at that more clearly indicate that cavitation is specifically what's happening in your system. So this is good from an analytical standpoint determining whether cavitation is happening or not, where it's most drastic, but it doesn't show us what caused the cavitation or how the system reacts. So if we see significant cavitation here, do we know if we can trust this maximum stagnation pressure? The same thing here with this significant cavitation, how do we know if we can trust this maximum stagnation pressure? So that's where something like graph results can come in. This is how I like to usually do analysis. So in our case, let's first make an animation so we have a good idea of what happened in the system. So here we can highlight all of our pipes. So if you instead had a more complex model, you could just select the path that you're interested in, use work, workspace to select just those pipes, and now we're going to animate using output. So usually I like to graph three different parameters when I first look at a transient event. I'll look at static pressure. I'll also look at volumetric flow rate. And then finally, if cavitation is a concern and you're getting kind of weird results, I would also look at vapor volume. In our case, we'll get rid of the maximums and minimums just so it's a bit easier to read what's happening in the system. So here we have our valve. Again, it's good to make a hypothesis. So with our prediction, we see a high pressure spike travel through. This will drop down to zero. This should drop down to zero, which will cause a negative pressure wave, which will be very hard to see because we're already operating so close to uh, vapor pressure. So again, this may be fine during steady state analysis. From an engineering standpoint, it'd be difficult to say that you can get this close to vapor pressure without um, like total certainty, or it's just not a good idea because also at that point, you're probably already pulling a vacuum during steady state. But again, it's an example. We're just showing uh, what's going on with this vapor volume primarily. So we didn't look at a graph of vapor volume before. This is just showing how much vapor forms in each piece of the puzzle as the transient occurs. So downstream of the valve, we expect pretty significant cavitation. And then we'll see if cavitation occurs when that negative pressure wave returns from the transient. So let's give it a watch and let's see if we are right. That's a little fast. Let's get that started again. So we see our initial high pressure wave. At the same time, we would see this low pressure wave, and we can actually see that cavitation is starting to occur. So if we follow the transient out, we see our high pressure wave travel. We see a reflection with our negative pressure wave. And here we're still well above the vapor pressure, so we don't see any cavitation. Downstream, we still see cavitation forming. And now we see that low pressure wave reaching that low point, and this is actually will be the start of the low pressure wave. So usually water hammer sequence is four pieces, high pressure, operating pressure, low pressure, operating pressure, and then it just repeats that. So here we'll actually see the low pressure travel through the system. So here now we can see cavitation is happening upstream of the valve with some vapor volume, and we also see some We'll call them interesting results on the flow rate. So generally, you would hope to see some very smooth, uh, continuous flow rate 
because all the stations are interconnected. So flow from one must go into the other. But here we see some interesting discontinuities that's largely caused due to this vapor volume. So we'll talk about why these kind of results happen as we talk about how cavitation is being modeled. But what we want to look for is flat lines in our system. So with such a low vapor pressure, we can see it's flat lining here. And that's where we're seeing that vapor volume. It's going to be flat lining at that vapor pressure of the system. So if we continue to play this out, we see some kind of weird results where pressure spikes are traveling through and we see that discontinuity and flow rate. So as cavitation goes on in your system, you have to inherently start questioning the accuracy of your results. And that's how we'll uh, start to close out the webinar is how do we know if the results that we're getting out of impulse are accurate or not, whether or not we should be making engineering decisions. So if we continue watching, now we can see what caused this high pressure wave. What's nice about graphing with output is we can quickly scrub the animation. And here you can see vapor is low. So the vapor is decreasing at this point and it's close to collapse. And when it finally collapses, that'll cause a high pressure spike. So again, we have a very aggressive wave front. So because forces are pressure differential, we're gonna see very intense forces. And that's what we showed with that initial graph during the presentation. So that causes a high pressure wave to travel. The water hammer sequence repeats. And now you see another low pressure wave where we're cavitating once more. So at this point, cavitation can introduce some numerical noise to your model. So these pressure reflections and kind of wiggly worms going through the system, they may be happening, but it may also not be accurate depending on how much vapor volume is forming. So on the downstream side, we can see that our cavitation uh, pocket is still growing and hasn't collapsed yet, and it's pretty significant. So this was the piece that was more than 100% of a station. We'll talk about what stations are and what that implies for your modeling but it would be much less trustworthy downstream due to this high cavitation. So when this finally collapses, the results are gonna be a bit more questionable. So again, animations are great because you can see how things change in the system and especially how signals are transmitted through pipelines. Another graph that I find very useful for transient analysis is transient pipe. So in this case, let's look at directly upstream of the valve and directly downstream. Let's focus on just downstream of the valve for now. So if we look at our model, we have pipe four. We want to look at directly downstream of the valve. So we want the inlet of pipe four. And in this case, we're going to do a little bit of a different graph. We're going to have pressure and vapor volume on the same plot. And then we'll also take a look at what the flow rate looks like. All right. So this really captures why pressure spikes occur at collapsing volume or collapsing vapor volume. So this is what we would expect with all of our experience with cavitation. So as vapor pockets form, and then vapor pockets collapse, that's what's gonna cause a pressure spike. So something that we can see here, again, if we do our predictions of what will happen in our transient system, with our valve closure, we would expect this to go to zero in the most optimal case. Because now the valve is closed, we're no longer supplying flow. It should go to zero as soon as the valve is closed. But that's not what we see here because of cavitation. So instead of going directly to zero, it actually reaches a new point. And there it continues to supply flow until it reaches zero. The water hammer sequence reverses and then it brings some flow back in, repressurizing the line. That can cause a pressure spike. So this flow from here until the vapor pocket starts to close down again, all of this flow is being provided by the fluid vaporizing. So because the vapor is much less dense, it can fill a much larger volume, 
than the volumetric flow rate being pulled by the rest of the system. So we'll talk about some of the assumptions that Impulse makes in modeling this cavitation component. But I think that the point of this graph is looking at how vapor volume can increase, decrease, and cause pressure spikes at a single point. Now, how this pressure wave transmits through the system, that would be better for a profile graph. But this shows at a point of particular concern, how does cavitation occur? So this would be great for a high point in the system, which our valve is in this case. Let's instead look at directly upstream of the valve. And let's see what kind of pressure, vapor, and volumetric response do we get. So here we see that same trend of vapor volume uh, kind of interchanging with pressure. So if we instead look at five seconds, which is very convenient and impulse to zoom into an area, here we see our initial pressure spike from the valve closure. We see that gain in uh, frictional losses since it's no longer flowing. Here we actually see that the valve did its job and went to zero. It's a little bit of a different circumstance because the flow was going into the valve and now the valve is closed. So it's slamming into a wall. Then we see the low pressure wave return, which draws some flow out. So anytime you see something like this, you can have a pretty good idea that cavitation is likely the cause because obviously your system probably wouldn't oscillate like this this quickly. And in some more drastic cases of cavitation, this entire graph may just reduce itself to noise after a certain point. But again, here we see that growth of vapor volume, the sudden collapse, and that causes this pressure spike. Again, we see vapor form, collapse, and pressure spike. So this is sort of the pattern that you would expect, especially with a water hammer sequence where it's reflecting back and forth. You can see this repeating pattern and ultimately it starts to dampen out as it settles to a better operating pressure. So if we instead go back out to 30 seconds, we can see that now the pressure oscillations aren't as significant. During those low waves, they're no longer creating uh, vapor at all. So that's where a transient pipe graph can come in handy. Profile graphs are great for seeing how these pressure waves travel through the system because, again, it's not looking at a component in isolation with water hammer. It's always thinking about how it affects the system as well. So those are the graphs and animations that I wanted to show you. You can also do force graphs if you create a force set. Some of the warnings that you'll see are pipe forces are not reliable when cavitation occurs. Again, this can be due to numerical noise and these pressure results may not be reliable. But if we take a look at the forces on the valve, so this is where we grab that force plot from for the presentation. All right, so that's everything in the modeling side. Again, graphs and animations are great for visualizing. Taking a look at parameters can indicate if it's a problem. And if it's a very significant problem, you'll definitely be getting a warning or even a critical warning message. So once you get these warning messages, the question becomes, how accurate is your system? So what creates that uh, questionable accuracy? To understand that, we have to understand how cavitation is being modeled in our system. So the first thing we want to understand is sectioning. Sectioning is one of the essential steps when creating a impulse model for this exact reason. So we have our pipe, and if we did it in impulse instead, now we have to section that pipe so that we can see how signals transmit through the system. So if pressure suddenly increases here, it can only travel a certain distance before this sees the high pressure, then this sees the high pressure, this sees the high pressure, so on and so forth down the line. And essentially like a snake transmitting signals through. So with these sections, they have fixed properties. So this section will have a flow rate assigned to it and a pressure assigned to it. It'll also have a vapor volume assigned to it. So if we look at that vapor volume, any formed vapor is gonna be constrained to one of these single sections, but the volume of the vapor is theoretically infinite. So that's why we can see things that are 100 or more than 100% of a computing station volume. So if this computing station was one cubic meter and we had a vapor formation of two cubic meters, 
that's allowed within the software, but it's going to give you some questionable results that you should resolve before using them in engineering applications. Something else to note is that there is no flow of vapor outside of a section, and flow is always going to be provided as a liquid. So if we take, for example, our section pipe, let's say we have vapor forming in the uh, first station, and let's say this is fine, we're at 62%. A certain amount of volume is captured by the vapor, and for transient analysis reasons, the pipe is still treated the same, so the gas won't actually impact how the wave travels through that station. Generally, it would change because some would go through the gas, some through the liquid, a little outside the scope of this webinar. But generally, this is assumed as liquid full, and we just calculate how much vapor is formed in there to inform what pressure the station should be fixed at, and also if a pressure spike occurs when that vapor volume collapses. So let's say we filled it all the way to 100%. If we went even further, we might expect to see a vapor pocket form in this piece of pipe. Again, with how impulse is sectioned and everything is done essentially in isolation, instead of expanding into the next station, we'll actually see just a more than 100% volume within this one station. So if you see something more than 100% or even more than 10%, more than 10%, you can maybe reasonably look at your results, but more than 100%, there you definitely need to take a look at what is happening in your system and seeing how the pressure response occurs and whether or not you can really trust that. So it won't flow into another section. It'll just continue expanding the vapor pocket in this station, even though physically what would happen is it may fill this entire pipe. So that's how it's being modeled. If we take it a little step further and look at how it determines the size of the vapor pocket, there's two different models in impulse. So by default, the discrete vapor cavity model is chosen. And if you find that cavitation is a major concern, you could take a look at the discrete gas cavity model. So by default, we use the discrete vapor cavity model and it's a much simpler model. So it's described with this pretty easy equation. And it's just using vapor pressure as the indicator of cavitation. So that's pretty consistent with what we've talked about so far. The pressure mark that we want to compare to always is that vapor pressure. And if our pressure goes below that vapor pressure, there you're seeing the formation of a vapor pocket. When cavitation starts to occur, the pressure in that station, again, imagine the section pipe, is fixed at the vapor pressure until that vapor pocket collapses. So to, to determine how that vapor pocket changes, we look at the volume of the vapor pocket, uh, we take the original, and then we look at how the mass has changed since then to inform whether it's growing or shrinking, and that can inform how a vapor pocket grows or collapses. So this is great, it's great for runtime if there's a small amount of cavitation or if there's no cavitation at all, it's not super strenuous on the solver. Whereas the discrete gas cavity model, you get much more accuracy, but it is also more intensive on the solver. So with the discrete vapor cavity, all it's checking is, is our pressure below vapor pressure? That may not be an accurate representation of the physical system, because liquids actually have gas dissolved in them, generally. So if you model this gas that's inside of the liquid, that can create a vapor pocket well above the liquid vapor pressure. So now we're kind of moving the goalposts, so cavitation may occur sooner than we would have expected. So while pressure is fixed at the vapor pressure in the discrete vapor cavity model, here now we're trying to model how this gas changes within the system. So in each station, we fix a certain amount of gas, and then how that gas can expand or collapse is modeled according to the ideal gas law. So now it's not fixed at the vapor pressure, now the pressure in the station is gonna inform how that vapor can uh, increase or decrease. So it'll generally be more accurate and it'll create less of that kind of sporadic oscillating noise that we saw in our animations and in our graphs, but it does have the downside that it'll take a little longer to run. If you are experiencing cavitation in your model, Definitely one of the steps should be comparing to gas cavity model results 
So there's a lot of questionability with the accuracy of cavitation. How do we know if our models are any good? Why would we model it an impulse if cavitation doesn't tell us how we should design our system to rectify it? So really it comes down to how do we know if our results are accurate? Luckily, you're not the first person to ask that question. There's a guideline that we've uh, produced. So the president of Applied Flow Technology, along with some other engineers on our team, actually wrote a paper guidelining how you can look at results generated by something like impulse under those cavitation conditions. So it's a very thorough approach. And it, as I mentioned before, it's attached on the webinar. I definitely recommend downloading it and giving it a look after this. And it's a very thorough approach that considers all of these different things that you can pull out of impulse. So if you look at the volume ratio, if we have less than 10% cavitation or 10% vapor volume in our station, it's probably more trustworthy than if we have 5,000% volume ratio. If cavitation is localized or if it's extensive, so for example, if cavitation only occurred downstream of our valve, we can probably still trust those upstream results. Uh, numerical model noise, so if we use the vapor cavity that can create a bunch of numerical noise compared to the gas cavity, how do you account for that in your analysis? And then also persistent cavitation. So if we have cavitation that forms in a system and at no point through the transient does that collapse, that's what would be considered persistent cavitation. We also have some similar guidelines in the impulse help guide. So if you're already working in impulse, you can go to help and pull up this article. Let's actually take a look at what that looks like. So here we can see how sectioning comes up as a topic, volume ratio comes up, whether that volume ratio is significant and what kind of confidence you can have in those results. So again, it's not something that you have to memorize and think about uh, all the time, but as long as you know where to look and you understand what cavitation is and how it can happen, then referring to guidelines like this help article or the attached guideline can certainly help you determine whether your results are gonna be trustworthy or not. That said, the guide covers quite a few different scenarios. So it has specific guidelines if cavitation doesn't exist, if it's isolated, and then depending on how much cavitation occurs, and then finally, if persistent cavitation exists. So persistent cavitation is, in essence, a two-phase phenomenon at that point because you're just modeling vapor formation. And since Impulse is a single-phase modeling software, there it throws a wrench into the accuracy of your results. So persistent cavitation, probably along the same lines of those 5,000% vapor volumes, where the results are gonna be much more questionable than very limited cavitation. So you can find these specific guidelines in that report. It's a good way to address it in your specific system, but we can also generalize some of their approaches as well. So one of the general guidelines is looking at the different results based on the two cavitation models. So because they're inherently different solvers, if cavitation occurs in both of them, cavitation is likely going to occur in your actual system. Uh, one of the results will ideally have less noise, and if they're consistent with one another, that's a good sign cavitation can happen. But again, introducing numerical noise, if you get more consistent results, you get the same peak pressure from that cavitation model, that's probably what you should be using for your analysis going forward. We looked at how vapor volume growing and collapsing can cause pressure spikes. Usually that initial pressure spike will be the most reliable of all of them. As we saw with upstream of a valve, once that pressure spike traveled through the system and reflected, that can cause even more cavitation, adding even more question into your results. So again, with that mathematical noise as well, you may have subsequent pressure spikes that are less trustworthy. Luckily, the initial pressure spike is gonna be the greatest. So if we're designing around max pressures or max forces, then luckily that initial spike is what we're gonna be looking at regardless. If we consider sections again, you may get better resolution in your model with additional sections, but taking a look at smaller sections, that can change how your vapor volume percentage is. So if you had a fixed vapor volume of one meter, if your section is two meters, that's 50% volume. If it's one meter, that's 
100% volume, so on and so forth, that can create a different uh, questionable result in your model as well. Another thing that the guidelines recommend is do, looking at sensitivity analysis. So does cavitation consistently happen because of how your system was initially modeled? So if you just had bad luck and all the stars aligned for cavitation to happen, you shouldn't design your system around that assumption. Instead, you should try to play with it and mess with different settings to see if cavitation is just gonna be a recurring issue, folding in the additional uncertainty of modeling your system. So if you vary system properties, for example, how does changing the vapor pressure change? If it's 10 degrees hotter, 10 degrees cooler, what changes? You can also change how the pipes are sectioned. You can change the model, which we discussed up here. And then you can also see how the transient itself can inform cavitation forming or not. Finally, we're all engineers, so we went to school, we all got good brains, hopefully. So use engineering judgment. So if you see something that seems questionable, like pressure spikes in the thousands of PSI or vapor volumes in 5,000%, obviously that may be a concern for your system. Or that may be a concern of how you're modeling it and therefore a concern in your results. So always fall back to engineering judgment. Of course, if you're not sure, you can always shoot us an email at AFT and we can take a look and see, you know, is cavitation occurring for the right reasons or is it for the wrong reasons? All right, so we're getting close. Uh, we're a little over time, so I apologize. Hopefully you guys find some value in the hour. So we got just mitigation and then a quick summary. So how do you mitigate low pressure or how do you mitigate cavitation? There you're looking at how do you mitigate a low pressure transient. So you can put vacuum breakers at your high point. That may create a separate issue by entraining air in your system, but they create vacuum pressures that can relieve that once high pressure returns through the system. You can size surge accumulators. So that can provide pressure in cases like a pump trip, where now it's supplying the remainder of that pressure when the pump fails. However, how the accumulator is sized or located can also cause issues unrelated to the cavitation. If you take a look at valve closures, if we didn't close our valve as quickly as in our example, maybe the pressure response wouldn't be as bad. So maybe we would still see cavitation downstream, but maybe we can eliminate that upstream cavitation. So slow is smooth, smooth is fast. It's better to gradually slow flow and then rapidly shut valves. Finally, you can change the system uh, parameters. So if you operate at a higher overall operating pressure, you're giving yourself much more margin above vapor pressure. Or if you lower the operating temperature, there you can reduce the vapor pressure, again, giving you some sort of margin. Uh, with a higher operating pressure, while it may help with cavitation and the response to those sorts of transients, it may be a concern with high pressure transients. So while you solve one problem, it may create a different problem. But like all things in engineering, it's really about threading the needle and uh, finding an ideal solution with the information you're given. All right, so we did it. We made it through all of our different questions. Let's do a quick review of what we learned. So what is capitation? What can cause it? It's liquid flashing or vaporizing during those low pressure transients where low pressure transients can be on either side of the valve or during a pump trip. Cavitation's a concern because of those pressure spikes and their forces. And depending on the fluid, it may pull a vacuum, which can cause collapse. We can recognize cavitation by looking for flat lines and pressure at the vapor pressure. We can do some of those graphing tips that I looked at. So pressures, flow rates, and vapor volumes. If cavitation is significant, there will be a warning and look at vapor volume in the output. So there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat. Once you recognize that it's an issue, then that's the first step to addressing it. How do we know that the results are accurate? It'll largely depend on how much cavitation occurs and where and for how long. And finally, how do you mitigate the cavitation in your system? Largely, it's gonna depend on the cause. So instead of slapping a Band-Aid and making your pipe withstand the high pressures, it may be better to adjust how you cause that transient to avoid cavitation entirely.
So preventative rather than reactive. So that's it. I told you it would be a lot, but hopefully you guys found a lot of value in this hour. Hopefully now you're thinking about how capitation applies in your own system. Of course, if you have any questions, you can always shoot me a personal email at my email, nickvastine at aft.com, and we'll do our best to get you a timely response. Uh, since you watch these webinars, and especially if you're reaching the end, uh, hopefully you find a lot of value. We're always looking for future topics. So if you have any ideas, feel free to shoot us an email at webinars at aft.com. Again, hopefully you guys learned something. If you have questions, feel free to give me a shout and keep an eye out for other AFT webinars coming in the future. Thanks again.